right, so now we're going to talk about everyone's favorite subject, money, right? Uh, and wealth creation. Um, so you've spent 20 plus years in financial services and wealth management. You know, first let's start with some of the trends you've seen, especially as it pertains to, to women, both within financial services industry as well as, you know, client side. Absolutely. So first of all, I've always been so passionate about helping women really tap into their financial power. And Indiana University, I'm an undergraduate of their business major. I remember my first investment uh, course that I took that I talked about the time value of money, compounding interest, then getting into financial services in the banking world and just the norms for women. And somebody said it earlier, like things like we don't talk about money. Um, just really enlisted the passion that I, that I continue to build. Um, it's something financial institutions are just starting to take notice of, women and wealth. And the reason behind that is, is really simple, is baby boomers uh, are aging. They have 80 trillion uh, in assets to transfer. And when you look at the statistics, women will get most, will get most of that. And that's mainly because their heirs are passing it on to their daughters or their, and or, I should say, their spouses, which typically outlive men. So that's the patriarch to matriarch. Patriarch to matriarch. And so financial institutions have taken notice of this and really want to start focusing on women and wealth. Having said that, though, um, what we're seeing or what I'm seeing is that a lot of financial institutions, it's, they're not really taking that on as quickly as they should be. There's, there's lots of opportunity here for us, for us women in the, in the audience. So talk a little about though on the, on the career side internally. So the transition 20 years ago, 20 plus years ago when you entered financial services, what it was like to be a woman in the industry versus you know today. Have you, have you seen hopefully the, the, the right path for women inside the organization? Absolutely, but uh, you know I've been doing this for 30 years, and I remember when I first joined uh, my first financial services organization, uh, it looked very, very different than it does today. Um, having said that, we still have a lot of room to grow in in the industry, and um, things like right, women typically still make less than men, and those are things that we need to continue fighting for, and. We do need to be open about talking about money and how much we make because the men do. Somebody said it earlier. They are talking about it all day long. And if we stay silent, we're not standing up for each other along the way to help our progression and the pay scale as well. So you had US markets at, at Wilmington Trust. I want to dig in a little more there, but you spent um, time at, at Union Bank. So you've learned probably through organizations how each organization is creating a culture that supports women internally, how they serve their clients. You know, what did you learn from, from Union Bank that maybe you know, now you're applying those learnings into your role at Wilmington Trust? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So when I was at Union Bank and I, I ran the wealth organization there, um, there was a time where myself and several colleagues realized that we really needed to get deeper with our female clients. And so we set it out with a working group to really talk about how do we, how do we build that, deep, get deeper with our female clients and build, and build a base where it becomes a, a comfort zone for all of us, again, to talk openly about money um, and financial literacy, quite honestly. So we did things uh, as simple as putting together on our website really life stages and female experiences um, internally, we set up programs for our advisors, both male and female, to ensure that they understood the inherent biases that were out there, whether talking to male or female clients, and ensuring that we, we closed in on those biases. We even talked about the business card. Is that yes, you know, yes, the business yeah. card? You're biased to giving it to the man over the woman when you meet with the couple. I was talking, I was telling Josh that, you know, there were, I was on a call and talking about that example is that you know, when the man and the woman come in for the meeting, don't just give your business card to the male. You should be giving it to both the male and female. And I had several male advisors call me afterward, just send me email saying like, oh my God, Lisa, I do that all the time. And so again, it's just an inherent bias that we need to clear up. Um, so the other thing we did at Union is create these events 
and it was really about experiences for women. And many times we brought in females um, in different stages of their financial journey. Again, just kind of creating this ecosystem for women that they could bond together and really talk about the fact that there are unique differences between women and men when talking about our our financial expect you know our financial life cycle and what we're going to do with our wealth there are unique differences there and you know how when you, when you think about when you look at the women that you're working with versus the men what are those differences you know and and, and how are you starting to address that through education you know when when you you know obviously the advisor composition probably has to change as you focus on women hiring more women advisors, but what are the unique aspects specifically that you're seeing and, and how are you then you know, addressing them? Yeah, so first of all, um, stating the obvious, all of us women are different, we are different. Um, however, there are some commonalities and life things going on in our lives that are very, very similar. And so when you look at that, that's very different for men. I stated it, first of all, women still unfortunately tend to make less than their male counterparts and so you compound that with taking care of younger children or aging parents maybe it's both and you're stopping and starting at work that all affects retirement savings so that's one that's one big factor that we that we have to understand and know that there's differences there um, there's the philanthropic side of it and women tend to be more philanthropic than men. This, this is part, part I love though. And so when you think about that, so they're thinking about their wealth as a form of how do I pass it on to my families and what causes are very much important to me. And so that philanthropic angle is really, is really important as well. Also, women tend to outlive men. So with that, they have to be thinking more about longevity and that, again, gets back to retirement savings, how they want the retirement to look, and then things like, what does long-term care look like? And what kind of insurance do I need? Because I'm gonna be living longer. And then the last one is, you know, I hate to say it, but when typic women typically tend to be a little bit more risk averse than men. And so not really thinking about how to, how to optimize their, their financial worth so they can get what they need out of retirement saving so th those are the four big ones that we see so uh, the philanthropy you know insight is interesting you know we you know, with the idea of work beyond wealth we really look at philanthropy look at how people are using their influence and success to really you know do good for the for the world what is that philanthropic insight and what does that look like combined with that web you know generational wealth transfer you know those two factors together you know obviously it's a positive thing but how do you see you know, the broader impact on society based on those trends? So, like I said, this, is, this to me is the, the fun part about women and thinking about the philanthropy. So, um, you know, let's talk about Mackenzie Scott and um, what she's doing there. And then we have Melanie Gates as well. So they're really taking their resources, their capital resources and digging in and investing in endowments and foundations to really tackle some of the world's persistent problems that we have. And then who isn't inspired by the story about Ruth Gottesman, who's from the, um, <laughs> right? right? Yes. So Albert Einstein College of Medicine, she donated $1 billion of her inheritance to all the students for free tuition in perpetuity. So these are the life-changing things when you think about, again, that transfer of wealth and most of it going to women that really brings that empowerment and control to all of us. So are your advisors also advising your clients on their philanthropic and their giving strategies or? Absolutely, yeah. uh, and we have experts for that on our team. And again, again, as we work with our female clients and something again at Wilmington Trust, bringing from my union bank side to Wilmington Trust is really taking that opportunity to think about our female clients and ensuring that we have the services and the capabilities and we're really listening to them and their needs and focusing again on those differences versus our male clients. So it sounds like you're optimistic in the direction we're moving, but 
Talk a little about now the future, right? So you've seen 30 years in financial services and wealth management. You've identified these trends. You're seeing the changes. What does the next 10 years look like? You know, are you, you know, overly positive on we're moving things in the right direction? And then for the people here, right, what could they do, you know, differently to help really move this, you know, financial movement forward? Well, I'm absolutely optimistic, Josh. So when you think again about this transfer of wealth, 80 trillion, and by I think 2030, 30 trillion, two women in the pockets. And you think about this philanthropic uh, piece of it, and you think about the more and more control that women will have with money and the financial empowerment that that brings together, we can literally change the world. Woo. And I guess, you know, we just heard a little on consumer behavior and, and consumer decision-making process. Obviously, women with wealth are making the consumer decisions as well. So when you look at investing strategy, philanthropy, as well as consumerism, um, are we just going to see, again, as the economy thrives, companies having to shift how they market, how they speak to this population? Do you think... You know, obviously you could talk about Wilmington Trust, but are you seeing that companies are starting to understand they need to shift their message in how they're marketing themselves? They need to, they're not doing it fast enough. So again, when you think about women gaining more and more control of, of the money um, and where they're putting it at, and when you think about the philanthropic piece of it, and now they can put their money into elections and politicians and causes that they really believe in and that becomes more and more money and that again builds that control and the financial empowerment and so bringing all that together shifts the voice and shifts the voice to more and more women and firm and not even financial institutions all companies really need to take notice of this um, because with that brings empowerment for us. We're able to control more and make more changes, whether it's political, well, it's, whether it's philanthropic, whether it's corporate. Um, I think about the example of entrepreneurship. So, you know, we st we're stuck on the statistic that female founders only receive 2% of venture capital funding. But as we control more and more money, now, if we're the entrepreneur, we've got more money to pour into our businesses, or we're females investing more into female businesses. So these are the kinds of changes that are going on that everyone, every corporation, everybody needs to understand and make those changes. Right. Karen, I know you're nodding on the funding uh, conversation. <laughs> we've heard a lot about the funding gap there. I think we have time for, for a question or two. Does anyone have any questions for, for Lisa? I can keep going. Uh, I do. Yeah, why don't we? Oh, you go. I have a question. Um, I, I heard from my friend Yachinde, who does this, uh, that when there's um, a marriage and the husband dies first and the wife now is taking care of financial affairs, often that also could represent a change to the wealth advisor. Maybe it was somebody that the husband felt more comfortable with. How do you handle that dynamic? Because you have all that experience and somebody sitting at the table for all those years, does that shift? Do you do, how does the organization think about putting the right people opposite to make people most comfortable? That's a fabulous question. And I'll, and I'll tell you through our studies and even with our own female clients, they're unbiased, whether it's a male or female advisor. What's most important to women, female clients, generally speaking, I should say, is that they're being listened to and that they're heard. And there's so many financial advisors out there, right? And they're talking fast and they're talking about them and they know, you know, mansplaining, we've all been there. Um, they just want somebody to listen and to hear them. So whether that's male or female and being able to lean in and hearing what our clients' needs are and what we can do for them. And as I say, listen more, talk less. That's, that's what they're looking for. So for us and our business, what, whatever our clients need and want, we'll be there. And if we have to make that change, we will. But I wanna be in a place, particularly in Wilmington Trust, 
where whether it's a male or female advisor, they get that and they get women. So it's important along that relationship to build, you know, sort of trust with both, you know, sort of family members. I think we're hearing the same thing around generational wealth transfer, right? That, you know, especially in these, it's, it's sort of generational skipping trusts where the younger generation gets that and says, oh, I don't want the advisor that my grandfather had, but it's so important to cultivate those relationships along that, that time horizon. Absolutely, so, you know, every generation as I say, take something and give something back. And it's a, it's a quote, you know, a quote I've said before is that, you know, my daughters, I have a, a 21 and a 22 year old, and they always say to me, mom, I've learned so much from you. And I say, but I've learned equally from you as well. And, and part of that, right, is the generational piece of that and teaching them myself um, what I know, right? And being in the financial services industry for 30 years um, and giving that back to them giving that back to women, uh, because I've seen it in my career as well, where um, there may just not be the interest or maybe just not the confidence. And so really bringing that all together. And you know, I go back to Union Bank and a lot of the female events that we had, I, and we would come out and either a female would say, oh my gosh, I've learned so much and I wanna learn more. Or they would walk out and say, wow, I knew a lot more than I did uh, than I thought I did, and so I feel great about that. And it's about just building that confidence. And even for the next generation as well, that's, that's equally as important. Right. Um, great, well, Lisa, thank you for, for joining us. Thanks for being a great partner. Uh, we really appreciate the support. Great seeing you all.